Okay, thanks everyone for attending. Veeam is pleased to sponsor this webinar for our valued gold service pr provider partner, ManageCast. I'm Brian Russo, and I work with Veeam service providers like ManageCast and assist them with their growth. Veeam has been able to work successfully with ManageCast to grow both of our businesses. Nathan Golden is president of ManageCast, and he will be talking about his considerable experience in the cloud backup service provider space and what ManageCast has done to help improve their business. ManageCast has demonstrated significant innovation by building on top of Veeam technology, and I look forward to Nathan showing you what his team has developed. Let's briefly discuss the agenda. This webinar is focused around Veeam service providers or independent consultants who are currently using or planning on deploying cloud backup services. Nathan will walk us through a brief review of ManageCast and how they came to develop the portal platform. Hopefully Nathan's experience will help you with your Veeam business. We will also show you the portal and how you can potentially use it to help your Veeam cloud business. Finally, we can take questions at the end. Just enter your question in the questions section and we'll get that answered for you at the end. Now I'm glad to turn things over to Nathan Golden. Nathan? All right, thanks, Brian. I wanna say thanks to Veeam for sponsoring this webinar. I also wanna say that Veeam has been essential to us and really helped our cloud business to grow. And also thanks for everyone attending this webinar. I appreciate the time you're spending and we'll try to make my experience in the cloud backup business useful to you and your business. Look, let's face it. I know sometimes backups can be a little boring. I like to say backups are like going to the dentist. Everyone needs to do it, but no one looks forward to it. So thanks again for taking time out of your day for this topic. Allow me to give you a quick background of our company. ManageCast started in February of 2000 as a consulting and integration company. During our first 10 years in business, we noticed many of our clients did not manage backups or DR as well as they should. It was often neglected and best practices were not followed. We began offering managed backup services in 2010, and today we are 100% focused on backup and DR. It is all that we do. From day one, ManageCast took on the role of monitoring and managing the backups for our clients. It's a big responsibility and one that we take extremely seriously. Of course, our primary goal is to make sure the backups run and stay running. We also need to make sure the backups are configured properly, especially around databases such as SQL, Exchange, Oracle, MySQL, and others. And often clients would not protect their critical data correctly. I firmly believe backups are one of the biggest things neglected within IT. And in my experience, a lot of IT admins and even management are naive about data protection. The fact that ransomware has been so disruptive is testament to that. I would encourage everyone in this call to ask honest questions about how well your organization manages backups, especially if your company is responsible for customer backups. So when that call comes in from a frantic customer needing to restore data, we must be ready to help. Missing three days of backups or more could be potentially very expensive for our customer and bad for our reputation. Even though we go through great effort to ensure our customers are well protected, when that call comes in from a customer, I have to say that there's always that feeling of this better work. It's definitely a situation of being a hero or zero. And it is this mindset that drives us to make sure we are doing everything we reasonably can to ensure customer data is well protected. And really, this is the heart of our value that we provide. It's really about being proactive. In my experience, one in 20 clients of ours will call or email us with the slightest issue that they see on their side. That's great. Wish everyone was like that. However, 19 in 20 clients don't, do not do that. And our goal is to notify that one in 20 and really all of our customers before they notify us. We try to be extremely proactive so our clients know we are on top of things. And the benefit, the huge benefit, is that this increases value and loyalty when customers know you are checking the backups better than they are. Over time, this creates a deep level of trust and loyalty with the client. So ManageCast started using Veeam for cloud backup and DR shortly after Cloud Connect was released in late 2014. 
The beautiful thing about Veeam is how widely deployed it is and the great reputation it has. We found that many clients were already running Veeam, so it became easier to get new clients for our backup service. And our engineers love working on Veeam because honestly, it, it just works. For all of these reasons, Veeam allowed us to substantially grow our business. Veeam is awesome, but as some of you may realize, it could be better for service providers who manage client backups, though it is getting better. I want to be clear that Veeam does offer Veeam Service Provider Console, and forgive me if I refer to it as Veeam Availability Console or VAC, as this was what the previous version was called. I also realized that Veeam has Veeam Enterprise Manager and Veeam One, and those are powerful tools, but they were not designed for the multi-tenant service provider. The Service Provider Console is designed for service providers, but it lacks historical data and only shows you the status of the last backup. So that means that if a backup runs every four hours, you will only see the status of the last backup. If you check backups on a Monday morning, you will not see the backup activity over the weekend. You also cannot see easily the historical data from the past. It is difficult to see spikes in data or data that is less data than usual on a backup. And as our business grew, thanks in large part to Veeam, it was taking us more and more effort to check the backups as thoroughly as we once had. And about a year and a half ago, I met a business coach and he asked me one key question that really stuck with me. He asked if the number of clients I had increased by 10, um, 10 times the amount that I have now, say I go from 200 clients to 2000, how many more employees would you need to hire? And I would encourage you to think about your business and how many more employees you would need if your business grew. My first reaction was, well, I guess I would need 10 times the employees or at least seven or eight. And the business coach said instantly, your business is not scalable. And I started to think about that question and how my business was not scalable. I realized it was difficult for us to see everything. I had already seen that as our business grew, it was harder for our engineers to keep doing as good a job as when we had fewer clients. So the solution. Nothing seemed available to do what we needed. So we set out to create our own tool. I hired developers and started working on it. I'm not sure how long it would take or even if it would be successful. It took four months to lay the foundation. And then we deployed an early version to our engineering team. The next morning I saw many more notifications go out, many more notifications go out to customers. And I came out and asked my team, hey, did we have a lot of issues last night? Did something go wrong? They said, no, we can just see the issues a lot easier. I knew at that moment we had created something useful. Since then, we have been in continuous development. Our goal was and always has been to incorporate things that we could not easily see. For instance, when a client backup machine stopped or crashed, or if a customer disabled a backup job, we needed to know about it. We needed anomaly detection when a backup sends a lot more data or a lot less data than normal. And we wanted to integrate with ticketing systems such as ConnectWise so we could automate the opening of tickets. Then we realized we also wanted to provide our portal to other service providers who might be in the same situation we had been in. So I want to be clear about a few things that our portal is. Our portal is designed around the needs of a multi-tenant managed backup service. It is a daily check tool designed to make a human more efficient to check backups and open support tickets. Without having somebody using the tool, it's not gonna be very useful. Also, since we had all this valuable data, we wanted to show our clients that we were checking the backups and who was acknowledging their events and when. And this allows us to show our clients what we're actually doing for them. Another benefit is that it allows non-technical people to see if backups are working or not. A few unexpected benefits. These are benefits that we came across that uh, we didn't really set out to, to solve. We used to check backups once per day, usually in the early morning. And if, the, if an error occurred after the checks, we would not see it until the next day. And the one in 20 client would contact us. Since we acknowledge the events in our portal, it is easy to see new events as they come in. We keep a big monitor up 
and it allows us to check backups in real time and allows us to send notifications throughout the day. Another benefit is it allows account managers to see high level status of backups, storage sizes, et cetera, without having to ask the engineers. This has been huge for us. It also allows us to see when trial accounts start backing up and monitor the status. So in the past, I was always having to go to the engineers and say, hey, is this client backed up? Hey, is this client experiencing issues? Hey, how much storage is this client taking? And now I can do all of that without having to go talk to an engineer. And there have been a few occasions where we can easily see errors in the portal and the customer can't easily see it from their side. And so the portal allows us to show them those errors more easily. All right, I'll go ahead and uh, show you a quick demo of the portal. And then we'll come back and talk about licensing and deployment. Okay, hopefully you can see my uh, portal screen. The first thing I wanna point out is that uh, our portal URL is portal.managecast.com and this is branded to be ManageCast. Uh, but we realized that other service providers may want to have their own look and feel. And so we can, based on the URL, change the login. So if I go to another uh, test account, portal.cloudbackupguy.com, I get the same login, but now I don't see the ManageCast branding. So we can use a specific URL that is unique to your organization using your domain name and brand it as though it's your portal but I will do all the demo using the ManageCast portal. We can also have multiple types of accounts. Um, we can have service provider accounts where when the service provider logs in, they can see all of their clients from one screen. And then, like I said, we can generate client accounts and let clients log in and they would only see their information. I'll go ahead and log in now as a test MSP account. And I've got a demo environment. I've only got three companies set up here and honestly, it's hard to show the true value of the portal with three clients. The more customers you have, the more useful this will be. You know, honestly, if you only have two or three clients, maybe you don't need the portal. You get 10, 20, 30, 50, hundreds of clients, uh, your problems get worse and worse in managing backups. So having a portal that takes all this information and puts it in one place is more and more valuable. So when I log in as, as this MSP user, I can see a high level dashboard. And one of the key things that we want to focus on is the historical data. So you can see here, because we don't have that in the VAC or the, the Service Provider Console. So here I can see the high level backups across all customers over the last 30 days, and I can change that to whatever time frame I need. Um, here's a calendar view which shows each of my customers and then their specific backups across the, each day. And again, I can change these time frames. If I want to look at the last 30 days, I can easily do that. Now, again, this is a demo environment. Sometimes I'll have gaps in my backups. Actually, we had a storage issue that affected multiple of our test accounts, and I can see a gap on my backup around the May 25th through 28th timeframe. Um, I'll be the first to admit that uh, we probably don't manage and monitor our demo environment like we do real customers, um, so please forgive me. But this does show when backups are not running. Obviously, if it's green, it's good. Uh, the number in the cell shows how many backups ran in that particular day. Um, I can have some days where I have mixed results, where I might have some failures and some warnings. Maybe I have some that are failures, but have one success. So each cell can tell you how many successes and failures you had in a, in a particular day. Um, I'll go ahead and click on one of these. If you can click on any cell, it takes you and drills you into that day and shows you the detailed information around the errors or successful uh, messages that you got for that day. I'm gonna come back to that screen. Just wanted to show that you could drill into the calendar and get that more detailed view. I'm gonna go ahead and back up and go to the, um, to the dashboard again. Um, down below, uh, we also show all of the repositories, all the Veeam repositories, and this includes the cloud as well as the on-site repositories. Um, so I can look at just the cloud repositories, or I can look at just the on-site repositories, or I can look at all the repositories. We also provide uh, trending information. And again, I have a testing environment without a lot of change. If I take this back and say, look at all of 2020, I can see that I've got a few spikes. Uh, but the idea here is that we're trending out long-term usage of storage and the repository 
and in a real customer environment, this would kind of help see storage growth over time. Down below that, I've got uh, some job ranking information. I show the jobs that had the most failures. Again, over the last 30 day period, you can change that to be whatever time frame you'd like. Um, I look at the jobs that ran the longest and usually when jobs run for 129 hours or 120 hours, there's probably something wrong. Um, and then I also look at how much data was transferred or the jobs that transfer the most data. So customers that you know move terabytes of data around and don't tell us and then we back up an extra terabyte or two of data, that'll pop up on this list. Down below that, we have inaccessible computers. These are Veeam instances, could be Veeam backup and replication consoles, or it could be uh, Veeam agents running on physical servers, uh, but they check in and have a heartbeat with the Veeam availability console, and we just pick up on that and show you anything that we lose contact with. Okay, so the dashboard is useful um, from a high level. It's useful for management types or sales types that just need to see, hey, is, are things green, are things red? Um, what are the status of things? But honestly, our engineers that do the daily checks on a daily basis um, go to the daily check screen. So if I go to this menu, go to the daily check screen, here's where I see more detailed information. And this is meant to be used on a, on a daily basis. Um, the screen is divided into two parts. The top part is the short-term history, and we default to the last two days. And the reason we default to the last two days is because we're assuming the backups are being checked daily and you only want to see the last day or two of messages. Obviously, if you need to change that to be a longer period, you can do that. But in our case, we default to the last two days to check the most current backups. The bottom part of the screen is the longer term history for a particular jobs. So if I were to click on a particular job, then it shows me the longer term history of what was going on with that job and the default is the last 30 days. So top part of the window, short term, bottom part, is long term. Um, let me go over some of the filters up here at the top. Um, right now you'll see that only the warning and failed filters are on and the running. So I'm only looking at the most important events. If an event was successful, that's great, but I don't need to check it because it was successful. So I'm filtering on just the problems. Also notice that I've got the pending filter on. So this is only showing me the pending backups. If I were to acknowledge an event, say I've looked at this and I've done something with it, um, I can click on the acknowledgement and it goes away. And the idea is that I wanna keep this completely clear and blank so that during the day as new events happen, they pop up. If I need to go back and see all the events, I click on all and so I see all of the acknowledged events. And I also get to see who acknowledged it and when. And that's useful mostly when you have multiple engineers working on a team. And you know, if somebody looks at an, a message, you don't need another person looking at that same message. So as, as things get acknowledged, you don't need to look at that anymore. So it's really good for team environments. Uh, we can also send notifications. Again, it was all about being scalable, making our engineer's job easier. If I click on the little airplane uh, icon here, I can create a ticket. And this creates this email notification. This says, hello, we've noticed that job and we pick up the job name as completed with job status. That would be picked up from this column, failed or warning. Um, and we're proactively looking into it. We can modify this. If needed. And then we include the message which would be this message here. And then we give it the ticket creator, whoever's logged in. So we try to automate that notification um, and generate a ticket automatically inside of our ticketing system. Um, again, down below, we show the longer term history. I'm gonna go ahead and change this to the last, uh, we'll do all of 2020. And again, this is a demo environment. I don't see huge spikes here. It's all pretty uh, uh, pretty average. I looked at this one at first and I thought, oh, there's a big spike here. And this is a duration, five minutes and 10 minutes. And you can see most of my backups uh, complete in less than five minutes. 
but oh, I've got a job that took eight minutes. You know, there's a spike. I mean, this is not really real world because it's a demo environment. But the idea is that over time, if you see a spike in duration, that could be a problem. Um, the little blue lines that are represented um, down here at the bottom, that's how much data was transferred during that session. So again, we're looking for a spike or an increase, unexpected increase in data. Um, and then you'll notice that I've got red dots and yellow dots, um, as well as the green dots. And the red dots obviously indicate a failure. So if I wanna go back and look, hey, what happened around uh, February, beginning of February, I can click on that and it takes me directly to that message. Um, I can also take any section of the graph and click and drag and drill in on that section. And again, I can still click on anything and go directly to those messages. So again, a lot of historical data allows me to go back and see the history. Hey, has this problem happened before? Is this reoccurring? Are there spikes in data? Are there spikes in duration? Um, having that long-term history is, is definitely useful. We also have filters down here. So if I just wanna filter on the warning backups, I can do that. I can filter on the warning and the failed. So I just see those very quickly or I can see everything. All right, um, at the top of the uh, the window, right now I'm under the job section, there's also a didn't run tab. And this is showing me all of the backups across my customers that have not run since yesterday at 7 a.m. So normally backups run at least once a day. If I don't have a backup that ran since yesterday at 7 a.m., I might have a problem. So I can select that or uh, note that that happened. Um, now it's common that people will disable backups or disable servers and maybe retire a server, retire a backup, and that's normal. So if it's normal, you can go in and ignore that. And so it doesn't pop up anymore. We also have this inaccessible tab and this shows us, I'll have to go back in time a little bit farther. The inaccessible tab shows us those machines that have not checked in uh, with, with us. So under the didn't run, it could be one backup out of 10 didn't run, right? But inaccessible means the whole machine has not communicated with us and obviously no backups have been running. So both of those are trying to address things that would happen and we wanna make sure that we knew about those things. So we built that functionality into the portal. And going forward, if there's other things that we miss, we're gonna be looking at how we make our portal more intelligent uh, and be able to tell us things that we really should know about. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, log out and I'm gonna log in as a end user, as a customer and show you a few things. This is the uh, Cincinnati Pizza Company admin, again, a demo account. And I can see I had a, a gap in my backups here very clearly. Um, I want to point out that we integrate Veeam Availability Console inside of our portal. And uh, one of the reasons we want, might want to do that is if a customer, like in this case, we have this customer that does offsite DRAS with us. Um, so they have a replication job that, that goes to our data center for failover for DR. And if they lose access to their local console and they need to be able to do a DR failover, they need to be able to do that from Veeam Availability Console or Veeam Service Provider Console. So if they click on that, it takes them to that. Notice that there's no separate login. Um, we're still inside the portal. It's nice that you don't have to manage multiple credentials. And uh, here you can see, you know, the normal BAC information um, available to you. And we can also have access to the failover plans. And here I've got a, a, a sample failover. Again, I've got one VM that replicates from our test environment to our DR environment. I'm gonna go ahead and start that uh, failover. And what this does is it uh, fires up the virtual machine on our side for DR purposes. And the way that we get to that is we have to use a different interface or vCloud director to do that. So I'm gonna go back to the dashboard and I've got vCloud director. So I click on that. And I did have to open up this in a separate window because vCloud director does not support iframes. I still have my portal here, but it launched vCloud director but you'll notice that I didn't have to log in. It automatically uh, logs in for me. Here is my virtual machine that is a replica. So this is a Veeam replicated VM. And it does take a moment here, but we should see some startup information here in a few moments. Okay, and the VM is now starting. 
This is updating. This should say powered on here in a moment. Okay, the machine is powered on. I'll go to actions and we will launch the console. And there's my server. Control delete. Log in and my server is ready. So it was important to us from a client perspective that we put all of the information into the portal to make it easy for them to do, not only check their backups, but in order to do failovers um, and access the other components of Beam Availability Console that may be useful. Again, we weren't looking to replace Beam Availability Console. We simply wanted to enhance it and give us the information in, in a different way. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, we'll turn it back to the slides and, and uh, we'll talk about some deployment options and, and licensing. So deployment options. Um, obviously, if you host your backups with ManageCast, you get the portal automatically and you can see all of your clients in one place. So if you currently don't have a solution or looking to deploy Veeam and you don't want to invest in the infrastructure, we'd be happy to host your backups and provide that service for you and include our portal along with that. However, we realize that a lot of service providers are already in business, they're already providing this service to people. They may be using another service provider, um, maybe not hosting it themselves, but using another service provider out there. And in that case, we can do deployment option two, where you can add ManageCast as a service provider under Veeam and use our portal even though your backups go to another service provider. In fact, we've seen where you can actually use multiple service providers and use our portal to see status across multiple service providers. And that's very easy to set up. It's just literally adding us as a Veeam service provider under Veeam at the client site or wherever Veeam backup and replication is running. And then that information goes to our portal. Um, and then I want to be, I want to stress in that scenario, you would not send backups to us. You can send backups wherever you want to go. All you're using us for is the portal to monitor those backups, even if those backups are going to a third-party service provider. And then option three, if you already have a Veeam infrastructure in place at your data center, and you already have your own VAC, your Veeam Availability Console or Service Provider Console deployed, we can use that data to populate the portal branded for your company, and that's where we can use a URL that is specific to your organization. So it could be portal.xyz.com or whatever your domain name is. It'll be branded for your use, and uh, you won't see ManageCast uh, associated with that. And you can continue to back up there to your infrastructure while you use our portal to help you manage it and even give access to your clients to, to see that information. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much, Nathan. That was an, an awesome demo. Uh, very innovative. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat. Uh, number one, uh, the, uh, when will you have ConnectWise integration? Uh, we should have ConnectWise integration sometime in the next 30 days. We are actively working on that. Uh, we have ConnectWise ourselves, and so we are actively working on getting that deployed, so we expect that to be within 30 days. Okay, um, next question uh, we've got is, is the cost monthly or yearly? Uh, we charge by the month and it's based on your Veeam usage. So if your licensing goes up or down, our licensing would automatically you know, adjust to whatever you're actually using. Okay, uh, next one is, I have an existing portal. Can you help me integrate Veeam information into our portal and not use yours? Uh, that is possible. I will say that I've got a, a really great development team. Um, those developers have learned Veeam. You know, when I first engaged them, they, they you know, could barely spell Veeam. But uh, after working with them for, you know, a year and a half now, they, they have become Veeam experts on the developer side and know the APIs and, uh, and the back end really, really well. So if there are opportunities to help improve your existing portals, um, integrate some of the Veeam information into that portal, um, I've got developers that could uh, probably assist with that. Okay, and the last one we've got in here, um, I saw buttons for Veeam Availability Console and vCloud Director. What are those for? 
Yeah, I think I, I may have brushed past that real quick, but uh, on the uh, when you log in as a user, you use the Veeam Availability Console, initiate the failover, and then vCloud Director is how you would actually get to your to your consoles. So we integrated those because those were tools we were using on our back end. Okay, and we do have one more. Um, which technology is used to pull the information from VAC or Veeam Service Provider Console? Uh, we use the APIs. I'm just scrolling through to see if we have any more. Uh, that seems to be seems to be the last. Oh, I'm sorry, I got one more for you, Nathan. Is uh, Veeam Service Provider Console required for this? Either Veeam Availability Console or Veeam Service Provider Console is required. It is how we populate the portal with information. Now, if you don't have Veeam Availability Console and the backups are going to you, uh, again, you can add us as a service provider under the Veeam installation, and those logs and that information will go to our VAC and enable the portal. So even if you don't have your own Veeam Availability Console, we can still send that information to ours. So I guess it's technically not required, but we need it to run somewhere. We either need to use ours or your own. Okay, and is Veeam service, uh, let's see, next question. Is vCloud Director required for the remote console? Yes, if you wanna be able to do failover, and this gets into whether or not you're hosting it or whether we're hosting it. Obviously, if we're hosting the failover, then you would be using our vCloud Director. If you have vCloud Director in your environment and you're using that for failover, then we would have to integrate with your vCloud Director and snap that into our portal. But yes, at, at current time, in our environment at least, we use vCloud Director for that console access. In the Excellent. Failover. Yep, that looks like that is all the questions that we have. Okay, well, I appreciate everybody taking time and you know, if anybody wants to have a separate conversation with me to discuss uh, you know, your own needs or what you're looking to, to do. Uh, again, I'm, I'm interested in feedback. I like to know what other service providers are doing or not doing, how you're handling these same issues that, that we had. And so I would welcome anybody to uh, reach out and, and have that discussion. Very good, that concludes our webinar. Thanks everyone and we'll talk soon.